everyone. Thank you so much. Um, before we even start, I just want to give a big shout out to the Science vs. Cinema guys. That's Kishore and Jeffrey. They're based in the Bay Area. They work, um, one's astrophysicist. The other one works with um, Adam Savage and has done some stuff with Lucasfilms. So they supplied a couple of the science graphics that you're going to see in a little bit here. So just big thanks to them. Without them, uh, we wouldn't have a chunk of our presentation. But I'm Casey Baum. I work at UNMC. I'm the Events and Science Outreach Coordinator. I am not a PhD. I am not a researcher. I am just a huge Home Alone fan and love science. And I'm John Sikorsky. I am an assistant professor and psychologist at UNMC. I have a PhD, and I brought the most pretentious mug I could find. But trust me, I have a PhD. Um, but honored to be here after 23 years of schooling and education and study. I'm fine. I'm happy that I can finally put my <laughs> education to good work. So. Yeah. Next slide. Um, just like to start off with a bit of a disclaimer. There's always one person. We and, have to do this. And you know who you are. No. So uh, Kevin McAllister is a fictional character. Have to just throw that out there. Um, APA guidelines would prohibit me from diagnosing someone without actually meeting them in person. We can do that because he's fake. And if I did diagnose someone, HIPAA laws would prohibit me from talking about it. All right. So you cannot diagnose a child as a psychopath. There is a line in the DSM-5, uh, which I happened to bring, you know, <laughs> brush the dust off of it in my office today, um, saying that, you know, generally, if someone's going to be diagnosed as a psychopath, um, it's after the age of 18. So this is all in good fun. Um, so sit back and enjoy, and we'll go through the hard science here. So why we're all here tonight, we need to talk about Kevin. We have decided that he is a straight-up psycho. Jonathan has. I just have helped him get there. <laughs> His eyes are full of murder. <laughs> and now, just again, disclaimer, we're not talking about Macaulay Culkin. No. We are talking about the fictional Kevin McAllister. Next slide. All right. So there is a psychopath test. Uh, if you're going to go based off of like the literature and the DSM, there are diagnostic criteria. So the psychopath, like antisocial personality disorder, 301.7 on page 659 for those following along. Um, but there is also, if you're a fan of like This American Life, there is a guy named Ron um, or John Ronson who uh, developed a 20-point psychopath test where sco items are actually scored, hey, hello, typo, zero to two. Uh, oh, and scores that. range from 0 to 40, so, you know, sometimes I'm a psychologist, not a math guy, so math is hard. Um, but any score above 30 will say, like, hey, this person probably meets criteria um, as a psychopath. So we're going to go through those right now. So number one, glib and superficial charm. It is demonstrated when you watch this movie when he interacts with the cashier, when he gives her the kind of, I don't think so, smart aleck, kind of know-it-all, he does also exhibit this behavior in Home Alone 2 with the hotel clerks as well. And we are going to mention Home Alone 2 a few times. Just bear with us. Forgive us. It was hard to find <laughs> gifts for everything. All right. So number two, grandiose estimation of self. I love that. So clearly, a person with delusions of grandeur, an eight-year-old child is like, all right, Number one, I'm going to be left home alone while my family travels, and that's just fine by me. Forget those guys. But number two, I'm going to stage like a torture chamber, like Saw-esque um, kind of thing for two burglars, and I'm going to do it just fine, not worried about my safety. It's going to be great. So who else would believe that they could successfully fight off two home intruders without alerting the proper authorities? And so, Two points for each of these first two slides, too. So he's up to four points yeah, if you're counted. doing the math. Third, need for stimulation. <laughs> Prime example. But Kevin is always um, bored, and he's always picking fights with his cousin, with his brother, with his parents. And when he's home alone, he's always trying to find things to keep himself occupied and busy. Um, very never sitting still for more than a second, just always moving, always trying on the next thing, always doing something. All right, so pathological lying and cunning and manipulativeness. So throughout the entire movie, he goes to the grocery store. He's like, 
no one would actually leave their child here. Like, I'm perfectly fine. Lies throughout the whole thing. But he's cunning and manipulative. So he can, like, create scenarios that are going to trick these adult burglars who, you know, are the wet bandits. They've been around life of crime. And this <laughs> eight-year-old is so cunning that he can manipulate them into his trap. And he's just really um, gregarious and outgoing. He kind of attracts people there. So another four points <laughs> right there. Sorry, lack of remorse uh, or guilt or lack of empathy. So when he makes his family disappear, he's very excited about that. Also, when he is basically murdering the wet bandits, who, I mean, are also questionable characters in their own right. Let's not pretend they're not. He is never sorry about what he does. In fact, he yells yes or fist pumps at least eight times. I counted. <laughs> I watched it and marked it every time. I might have missed one, so maybe it's nine, but it's definitely eight. No remorse. Yeah. But now we're going to get a little crazy and talk about some hardcore data. Here is a blowtorch on your head for over seven seconds. Now, what happens in the movie? Just a nice, nice little burn. I mean, it hurts, yes, a little. A little, I wouldn't even say second degree. Maybe I don't see any blistering. It looks like a nice medium rare. Yeah, medium rare. <laughs> Tender to the touch. He dives his head in snow. Just a disclaimer, don't do that. It makes it worse. If you are to get a normal second degree burn, you will get some scabbing over here. If you have a blowtorch on your head for over a normal amount of time, which is over seven seconds, you are going to end up with skull necrosis, which is that third degree burn down here, which basically melts your skull. And so your skull is dead. That's the proper term. And you would have to have a skull transplant, and you probably would not survive. So murder one. So speaking of murdering skin. Yeah. Oh. Now we're back to burn. Uh, we're going to do a little myth busting. As I said, my friend uh, works with Adam Savage, who used to do this all the time. So we're going to take the hot doorknob. This doorknob needs to be 1,000 degrees for it to really hurt you bad, bad, bad. It will hurt, but to really, you know, we know what happens. So we're going to assume that that is what's happening and we know what happens. In reality, next slide, we have our door handle heated with our barbecue little heating tool here, and it is at 784 degrees. Our outside doorknob is only, I don't know what that was, it was like 74, I think. So my friends took a blowtorch and said, what can we do to get it to 1,000 degrees? Blowtorch it, but yet the outside door remains only at 82, so it's not going to hurt you as bad. It will hurt, it will burn, but you will not end up with necrosis. So for all of you like scientists and future scientists out there, another disclaimer, don't try this at home. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Please do not. <laughs> So this is a kind of a busted one where he tried to do some harm. It hurt, but he didn't get to that murder level. But what we're going to talk about next is pure murder. Let's welcome the paint cans. So we're going to do some math. Let me get my notes because I, too, am not the best at math. First off, a paint can, 12 pounds. Kevin, four feet tall. Stairs. From here, stairs are about eight inches. There's about 10 stairs, so we're going to estimate about 10 feet of height. The free fall. So we're going to go with 17 miles an hour, but it doesn't just fall. Kevin throws it, so let's give him 20, thinking he's stronger than he might be. After that, we have deflection, where it's going to hit these guys. So we're going to have a couple of inches of deflection, and so we're going to end up with 123 Gs. So this is what the movie says happens. Next. Fun times. Get right up. We're going to show you what actually would happen if you have really small children. Maybe shut their eyes just for like 20 seconds. Roll the videotape. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's my favorite, though. No. <laughs> Wait. No, no. Watch that neck. <laughs> night night. Yeah. So not full decapitation. A little bit nearly headless Nick, Harry Potter decapitation there for you. It's good to have goals. <laughs> ah. 
I know. It still goes. Just wait. <laughs> There's a bounce back. So obviously you're not going to fall onto your friend and get back up. That'll ruin Christmas right there. <laughs> War on Christmas. <laughs> oh, I hope you all are hungry. <laughs> all right. Back to this. So shallow <laughs> affect. All right, what eight-year-old <laughs> watches the movie Angels with 50 Souls? Filthy. Or, or filthy. filthy. Filthy souls. <laughs> Hashtag psychologist. <laughs> All right, so this movie is like a movie within the movie. And we can kind of see as he progresses through the show, um, kind of this meta change where he's starting to emulate what he sees in these films. So his personality is not his own, but he's actually mimicking that of <laughs> other people. Like... You know, Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. All those types of things. Number nine and ten. Parasitic lifestyle and poor behavior controls. Again, we know that's from the second one. So for this one, Kevin has never had a real job because obviously he's eight. But he kind of mooches off his parents. The pattern will clearly continue throughout his life. Um, that's just what we have assessed as researchers here. <laughs> um, poor behavior controls. Kevin actually can control his behavior very well. He just chooses not to. He has planning skills, but he has a goal. He has a goal to revenge and keep his house safe. When at any time, he could have stopped this. Mm -hmm. All right. So early behavior <laughs> problems. The entire movie. All right. We have a kid lying. But two, sexually, sexual promiscuity. All right, so in this movie, he climbs bookshelves in search of the Playboys. Like, obviously, <laughs> this is the start of his like, whole downward spiral of sex addiction growing up. We're reaching a little bit on that one. <laughs> it's a bit of a stretch goal. But we're going to go with it for the sake of the movie. We won't give him that many points. Yeah. Uh, 13, 14. Impulsivity and irresponsibility, and if you're watching that splat, we could also make a slide on what would happen if you slide down your banister for some more science, but we're not going to do that tonight. Um, the irresponsibility and the impulsivity. First off, he knocks over the milk, ruining everyone's peaceful pizza dinner, and that kind of sets the motions of the film, you know, gets them going. So that's number one. The irresponsibility is Kevin destroys his own house while defending it, and when he goes to New York, his uncle's house. He likes to destroy and does not care. So we have a trend in the data. Mm -hmm. That's All a right. scientist thing. <laughs> yeah. So lack of realistic long-term long goals and failure to accept responsibility for his own actions. So right here, we see the turning point in Kevin's life <laughs> where he spills the milk, blames poor, innocent bully buzz, and it sets off this life of crime throughout <laughs> his entire life. This is the moment of change. So lack of realistic long-term goals. Clearly, um, he is going to be someone who doesn't take a lot of responsibility or doesn't really care about the outcomes of his behavior because his goal is that immediate reward. I'm going to get candy. I'm going to steal a toothbrush. I'm going to do whatever. So again, four points. <laughs> Count it. <laughs> I'm going to have Jonathan explain this one because I don't feel I can do it justice because it's another projecting into the future. <laughs> All right. So juvenile delinquency. He steals here. Um, he steals a toothbrush in this film. He also, in the second film, you see this evolution and escalation in problematic behavior because he takes his father's credit cards <laughs> and racks up thousands of dollars in bills and toys <laughs> and room service and all of that. No guilt, no remorse. And again, we can't project this part on him, but clearly with his sex addiction that we've <laughs> diagnosed him with already, chances are he's going to have a lot of short-term <laughs> relationships, just a problem with commitment going on so. so our final two points are revocation of conditional release and criminal versatility well the first one Kevin has not yet gone to prison in the Home Alone movies but his actions suggest he will probably be arrested many times throughout his life again going back to everything that's happening to him when he goes older and granted in this he'll get a second chance of life after the traumatic events in the first film he learns nothing and repeats them probably even worse in the second film and then with the criminal versatility you know he commits a wide range of crimes uh, between these the ages of eight and ten breaking and entering uh, shoplifting credit card theft um, working with no or like you know associating with known felons we have wet bandits and our, our favorite joke is Donald Trump <laughs> 
sorry. <laughs> um, and the second movie. <laughs> second movie. He is in there, so it works. <laughs> so if you add up all the totals, we get a final score of 34 out of 40. So Kevin is a verified psychopath. Remember, 30 was our, our line. <laughs> yeah. So. Final score. Final score. And then what did we learn? A few things. We learned he's a bit too happy to be family free and really likes to murder people. We didn't even touch, talk about this, but his closest friend is an old man with a shovel. <laughs> and what kind of kid watches a movie called Angels with Filthy Souls, who in the second one watches the second one of that, too? So he also started the war on Christmas, we decided, just for fun. And we give the science in this movie, not the movie, but just the psychoanalyzing and the actual physics in here, two and a half face tarantulas. Uh -huh. Final slide. Uh -huh. and Thank you guys for coming yeah, thank out. Thank you very much. Thanks, Film Streams. Thank everyone for doing this. Thanks, the Science versus Cinema guys. Now let's have some fun and watch Home Alone. Thank you.